blessing on every word that we hear. All right, brother, come open the word to us. Thank you so much for coming. What is a blessing to be with you guys tonight? My name is Corey Meyer. And as you saw in the video, we're missionaries in Madrid, Spain. Uh, we landed at the very end of 2016. And we spent the first, I spent the first year and a half uh, studying the language, learning how to speak Spanish. And then later on, learning the culture, learning the, just the way people live there, which as you may have known, it's very different. Spaniards still practice, they're very big on their siesta still. That's still something I've never gotten used to. From 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, everything shuts down. I mean, they literally roll the sidewalks up. Businesses close down. I mean, they just shut everything down between 2 and 5. And I still, I still, as an American, I still make, I still time I go out in the afternoon trying to get something done. And I, I, I forget. And then I see all the, the places. They literally have like these big shutters they put over the doors and, then we have people that invite us for dinner, and they eat dinner super late there. So they'll say, "Hey, come for dinner," and and you can be that you can come at nine. And we get there at nine, and they have hors d'oeuvres, they have olives and cheese. And of course, we're starving. And then by uh, by ten ten thirty, we finally sit down and have dinner. And so that's been a, that's been a, that's been a challenge, especially for my wife. My wife's an early early. She goes to bed early, so for her, it's been extra difficult. But by God's grace, we get we get through that. We've cut. We've you know we've we've um, changed our habits. I usually go to bed now at two in the morning. That's when I usually go to bed, just because that's just how things go there. But it, we're we are thrilled at what God has done, and um, I'm excited to be able to be with you tonight and share about our ministry in Madrid. My story begins with my parents. My dad was a was in the U.S. Army, and he was stationed in Baumholder, Germany, in in, in the in the early '80s. And a missionary had planted a church right outside the military base in Germany. And while my dad was stationed there, uh, one of his co-workers invited him to church. And then at this, the same time, my mother was waiting at a bus stop to be taken on post to do her shopping. And then one of the wives invited my mom to church and shared with her about the gospel. And so that Sunday, my parents went to church and heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ at a Baptist church planted outside the military base. And they both received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Fifteen years later, my dad would go back to pastor the very same church where he was saved. I had gone to Bible college. I graduated, and I was looking for where the Lord would have me to serve. And I felt called to go to work with my dad in Germany. So I went to Germany with my family. My wife, her name is Claudia. We have two daughters. We have Hadassah, who's 15, and we have Shanna, who's eight years old now. And I went, we went to work with my dad in Germany. This is in 2008. And the way we did that was I got a job working for the U.S. Army, which allowed me to be in Germany. And so I worked for eight years for the U.S. government, for the Department of Defense, and loved every second of it. I actually thought I would stay working forever. We had a nice little, my wife and I both worked on the military base. We loved our life living in Germany. We, had, we were very active in the church, working with my dad. I was the assistant pastor. But what happened was I went to a missionary conference met a missionary that had come up from Spain. And he brought with him a young guy from his church named Herson. And Herson and I became good friends. And Herson said, hey, you should come visit me in Madrid. So I took him up on his offer. And my wife and I went for our anniversary to visit him in Spain, in Madrid. And we were going into the city each day and exploring the city. And where he lives is on the outskirts. So we would take the subway in and then back out. And we were waiting at a bus stop where there's a, we were waiting for our, the subway and it's like an underground mall. And there's like thousands of people who pass by there getting off the buses and onto the subway and vice versa. And I remember sitting there taking a coffee, drinking a coffee. And that, at that very moment is when God broke my heart and gave me this tremendous burden for the people of Spain. And I went home back to Germany and I prayed over it for a year and a half. I just could not get away from it. A military church actually had, the pastor had to go back to the States. This is in um, the Eiffel Baptist Church in the Spangdalem Air Force Base. The pastor had to go back to the States on emergency medical return because the, the hospital in Germany couldn't help his wife, so they had to go back to the States. And he asked me if I would fill in for six months, which I did and loved every second of that. And the church would later on uh, offer me the position of to become their pastor. And so I took two weeks to pray about it, but Spain just... Again, it just kept coming back, and I couldn't get away from it. And I realized then it was clear 
this was God's will for my life. So we surrendered to missionaries in Spain. We raised our support, and then we landed in Spain in 2016. And we, I was learning Spanish, and then we planted our church, as you saw in the video, at, at the very end of 2017. Oh, in the middle of 2017, we planted our church. So what I didn't show in the video, that's kind of to walk you through where we are up to, up to that point. Where we are now is our church grew during the pandemic. Somehow, when people could come to church, no one really wanted to. But when we had this, when we had in Spain severe government restrictions, they had the limited capacity. And so when people couldn't come to church, that's when all of a sudden they wanted to come to church. And we were ended up doing two and sometimes three services because the capacity for our building was 14 people. So we had to do like three services to get everybody in. And that was a, that was a challenge. But somehow through that, our church grew. People grew spiritually and we grew in number. And we began praying about where we could find, as you said, I saw, as I mentioned in the video, phase two was looking for a bigger place for us to meet. We rented a little storefront to start. We were driving down the street one day and my wife said to me, why don't we consider trying to buy something? Instead of just renting, what, what about the possibility of buying something? Where we were in the city is in a great location. More than half of our people come by public transportation. They don't drive, which is normal in the city. People, even with pretty good incomes, they don't want the hassle of driving. And I guess kind of what Portland is doing, making it more and more difficult to get in the city with your car and making it things difficult. Madrid is like that. They make it very hard to get in the city center with your car. So more and more people just take public transportation. So half of our church come by, by train. So we're right next to the train station. From our church, you can almost look down the street and see the train station. So we're in an amazing location. And then 10 minutes walking is the subway station. We were driving on the street, and we saw right behind us was a building for sale. They wanted 65,000 euros, which is like 80,000 U.S. dollars. And I said to my wife, I said, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of money. Like, that's, that's, a big, that's a big ask. And we're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't see how this is the right time to try to be raising funds. People, you know, worried about their jobs and, you know, the economy and all that. But I was out praying. I, I, do, this, I do this long prayer walk where I actually walk through a, an olive grove. And, I, and while I was out in the olive grove, the Holy Spirit just, I just, it just struck me. All of a sudden I had this peace, this clarity that this is what God wanted us to do. Amen. So I took my phone out right there in the olive grove and recorded a video. It wasn't impressive. It wasn't edited. It didn't have music. It was me sweating. It's a 21-kilometer walk. I don't know how many miles it is. Like, I think it's 17 miles. Anyway, I just recorded, my, recorded this video on my phone, and I posted it to our Facebook account for, to our churches and our, our, our friends to see. And, wow, it was amazing to see what God did. We started off trying to raise the down payment, which was 30000 And I was asking if people would pray with us about the down payment. And all of a sudden, wow, people were just excited about the idea of us being able to buy a place. And the love offerings just started rolling in. So I, I and before we know it, we had our 30000 So I went to the bank and I said, hey, we have our 30000 which is like about half. Look, I'm not quite half of the asking price. Surely it's enough to get a loan. And they looked at it and they studied it and they came back and they said, hey, the answer is no. Because you don't own any property in Spain. And there's no guarantee that you're not just going to run off and leave us holding the bag. <laughs> so then I had to go back and say, hey, guys, we have to end up raising the whole amount is what we needed, which was ended up being close to 100000 we needed to get in the door to pay taxes and, you know, all the all the strings attached. And so that was like first it was 30000 Now we're looking at raising 100000 And we're already in the middle of the process. So more prayer walks for me. <laughs> Uh, some some people have noticed on the video I've lost weight. Well, it's from all those prayer walks, and walking through all, all the olive grove. But it was amazing that in a, in a matter of six months, in a period of six months, God raised all the funds we needed. We raised $100,000 in six months, and we purchased that building. There's a picture on our Facebook account. If you'd like to follow our ministry, to keep up our updates, we have the Myers of Spain Facebook account. We post videos and updates Anyway, on there is a picture of me holding the deed to the building. Uh, it was a surreal moment. I'll never forget it as long as I live. 
we were ushered into this room and there was the owner of the building. There was our lawyer. And then there was the, the gentleman officiating the meeting and they sat there and, and I had to call our bank and do a transfer over the phone. And so I called the, the bank. I got a hold of the teller and I was a little nervous, all this in Spanish and everyone's watching me. It was a tense moment. He was asking me these questions and finally the transfer went through and the, the, a green light came on on the, on the, the previous owner's phone. And as soon as he had the green light in his phone, he reached over and handed me the keys. And when I had those keys in my hand, I, can, I can't tell you the joy that's in my heart. It was just, it was like, wow, this is, this is surreal. I grew up hearing stories of missionaries. Like I grew up being fascinated with all these stories of what other missionaries had done. And here I am you know, living it out. And so it was just, it was just incredible. So we went, we, went, we went from that moment with that meeting, we all clapped and I had the keys and I got the deed. From there, we went right to the church building. And wow, what a difference this time. And I opened the door, and we walked in, and we knew this, this is ours. Now, it was a bar. It was a, it was a bar, what they call in Spanish, an, an old man bar. It was dirty. It was disgusting. They had booze bottles everywhere, rats and roaches. It had been abandoned for eight years. Nobody wanted it. But praise God, it went from a place that was destroying lives to a place that, by God's grace, is saving lives. And so the, our church has um, been in a renovation project. We finished the downstairs as quick as we could to begin having services. So we bought the building at the end of December. And by March, we started holding services in that building. And right now we're in the process of finishing up the upstairs. So we're still not quite done, but we're there. And the church has been growing. And we've had visitors. Somehow they find us. We have, we have no sign out yet. We have paper on the door because we're under construction still. And when you walk in, it's a construction site. You have to go downstairs where the main auditorium is. But by somehow, we still get visitors. People have been saved. Just three weeks ago, we had a baptism service. I was able to baptize new believers. And so I'm just here to testify that God is good and that the gospel still works. There's still power in the preaching of the gospel. Even in a hard place like Spain, this 1% of the population of Spain identify as born again believers. So we have 44 million people in our country. According to that, 43 million have probably never one time heard the gospel, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have our work cut out for us, but we celebrate what God is doing. We celebrate the people that have been saved, that have been born again and discipled and growing in Christ. I have so many stories. I'll just tell you this one and then we'll get into the message. We had a phone call three months ago, a message rather to our church Facebook account. Someone wrote us saying, hey, a gentleman from Venezuela. He had been working in Venezuela for a short time. He's from Miami, Florida. And while he was in Venezuela, he met a Spaniard. He met a Spanish lady and he began to have a burden for her salvation. They worked together, I think, for three weeks on a special project. And then she returned to Spain. He returned to Miami. He looked up uh, a Baptist church close to where she lives, which happened to be us. And so he wrote us and he says, hey, my friend, um, I have a burden for her salvation. I bought a Bible. I'd like you to meet with her and give her the Bible. So we met with her at a McDonald's. My wife and I went there. We met with her. We sat down, never met this lady in our lives. And we sat down and we were talking maybe two minutes. And she just broke down and began to cry. And she began telling us all about the heartaches in her life and how she's just been looking for someone to love her. She's looking for someone that something in life that made sense. She's like in this cold and cruel world we live in. It seems like nothing makes sense. And so we took the Bible and we said, we want to tell you about something that does make sense. And we want to tell you about someone who does love you. Not for who you're supposed to be, but for who you are. And so she got saved. And the baptism I told you about, we had three months ago, I was able to baptize her. And she's been super faithful. And we got a report that just this morning, just this morning, her father got saved. Her dad's been coming faithfully to our church. And now he got saved just this morning. So we, we're really excited about what God is doing. It's been chipping away the stone. It's been chipping away one by one, little by little. But we're growing 
little by little, praise God for it. Uh, Our focus in our church is to celebrate every victory, celebrate every small victory that God gives us, and we stay just amazed at what God is doing. Well, let's take our Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, the church that Paul was so proud of. I love this book, and I love this passage. When we talk about this church that Paul planted, that he was super proud of. But it's unique when we look at the circumstances under which the church was planted and how it thrived in his absence. In the book of the first book of First Thessalonians, chapter number one, uh, we'll begin reading in verse number one. And the Bible says, Paul and Silvanus and Timoth- Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in prayer in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye trusted to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for this wonderful church, Lord. God, I thank you for their pastor. Thank you for this labor of love here. Thank you, Lord, for this body of believers that we've come together tonight in a, in a special time to, to celebrate you, to celebrate the freedom we have in Jesus Christ, our salvation, how you change and transform our lives. Guide us tonight as we look at your word, and we are just remember, reminded that this is all about you. You're the main event. You're the main dish. God, you are our Savior. You are our all. We thank you for what you do in our lives. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. They were not favorable circumstances under which Paul planted this church. To know the, the, the story, we go to Acts chapter 17, and there we find the backdrop. We see that Paul planted this church, and he was only there a short time before there was a commotion. And there was the city leaders that came to try to arrest Paul. And they took the they took the principal member of the church, Jason. I'm thinking in Spanish. Forgive me if, I, if there's a lag here. Uh, they took the principal member, Jason, and they, they, they held the church building, which we believe was his house, as a deposit, a security deposit. And they said if Paul, Paul escaped, they had told Paul, get over, you know, get out now while you can before this mob comes to our house. This mob came to the house to to cause uh, damage and to cause uh, problems. And Paul was able to escape, but they held, they told Jason, they said, we're going to hold the deed of your house as like a security deposit. And if Paul ever comes back, you're going to lose your house. And so Paul was in a tricky situation. He wasn't able to return without damaging the church. And so he was kept out. So when, we, when he writes 1 Thessalonians, that's the backdrop. It's this church that he had, had planted, but he was forced to leave. And they were like very difficult situations. We saw in verse number 6, it says, And you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. These are not favorable times. The government wasn't helping this church. and As a matter of fact, they were, they were doing everything they could to shut this church down. But there was something amazing happening in the hearts of those believers. We see in verse number one, I'm sorry, for verse number three, it says, Paul mentions three things, three things that he sees in this church. He was proud of this church for three reasons. He says, number one, 
remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And we see here what this is saying. It doesn't say that faith, that works produce faith, but we see when we read this carefully that faith produces works, that it is the transformed life, it's the transformed heart that produces good works. It's the person that has been saved and born again, that's been changed, that's been given the Holy Spirit, the person that's been transferred from darkness into light, that's the person who has this joy abounding inside of them that they can't just but help tell others about what Jesus means to them. They can't help but tell others about what God has done in their life. This is the work of faith. Faith is the, the root and work is the fruit. And so religion tells us that you have to work in order to have faith. But Jesus says it's the transformed heart and life that produces good works. He has changed my heart. He's given me spiritual life. He's given me eyes to see. He's given me ears to hear. He's given me a heart to understand and to know and to love. That's the work of faith. And Paul is so proud of this church that even in the persecution, even in these difficult times and these difficult moments, they went forward as a church against all odds. This little church somehow went forward because they trusted in the power of God. It was the faith that was working in them that produced these works. It was their faith that Paul goes on to mention here at the end of the passage that others spoke about. They didn't speak about how big the church was. They didn't speak about how beautiful the church was. They spoke about how much faith the people in that church had. Because despite all the situations, despite the, the church, the government holding the deed of the church as ransom, sort of, and, and not letting Paul return, and despite all the, the commotion and the mob coming against the church, despite all that happened, their faith was flourishing. And their faith was, was, was people were talking about it all around, saying no matter, no matter how discouraging the situation is, this church continues to grow in their faith. They may not be growing in number. They may not be growing in finances, but they're growing in their faith because God is working in their hearts. God is transforming lives, and God is doing something in this, the, the hearts of those believers there so that other churches, says verse 7, so that you were in samples or examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. I say there's something happening in this church that's, a, that's they're, they're, they're an example to others. Of, of a transformed heart and a transformed life. So Paul is saying in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, and then number 2, your labor of love. And again, we see what Paul is saying. It's love that produces labor. It's not labor that produces love, but love is the root, and labor is the fruit. You can't help but think of a mother's love, the, the love that a mother has for her children. And in verse in chapter 2, Paul would go on to keep everything in context here. Paul goes on to talk about the, the mother, the caretaker of children. That, that word in, in the first century meant mother caretaker. It also meant a nurse. Paul is saying that this, this church, they exercised a special kind of love. And as a nurse, you don't get frustrated with your patients. You realize that they're sick. You realize that they say things that sometimes they don't mean as a result of medication or they're in, they're in pain, they're suffering, and their attitudes aren't good. And they, they sometimes insult the nurses. I, I remember that we sometimes got phone calls. My, grand, my grandfather was a very bad patient uh, in the hospital, and he, he would give the nurses all kinds of trouble. And he'd raise Cane, and he'd get himself in trouble. And I'd get a call and I have to go down to the nurse's day. I have to go down and, and, and make peace and, and sort things out because he was a very bad patient. And I would go there and find out, say, what did grandpa do now? You know, and say, so he's, he says that we're, the CIA is putting stuff in his medicine or, you know, he's coming up with some kind of thing, some reason he's going to take his medicine. So, and he insulted the nurse. He said some things. And I remember one particular time. I felt really bad for this really sweet nurse that was taking care of him. And I met her outside and I apologized to her for what he had said. And she said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, no, 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 it's okay. Because this is my job. And I understand that your grandfather right now, under heavy medication, 
with his illness. He says things that don't really come from him, but more it comes from the illness. So I realize it's the illness speaking and not him. And my job as a nurse is to take care of him and to love him. And I'll never forget that. So years later, I'm reading this passage, and I'm in chapter 2. And it says, um, verse 7, if you're in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. This helped me a lot. This verse has helped me quite a, quite a bit in Madrid. Progress isn't fast like you'd like it to be. The church isn't growing like I'd like it to grow. People resist the gospel. They reject the gospel. But this verse has helped me tremendously because it helps me understand that I'm like a nurse taking care of sick patients. And when people reject the gospel, it's not so much them, but it's they're in a lost condition. They're lost. And the Bible says they don't have, they're spiritually blind. We says we're, we're, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. They can't appreciate the beauty of the gospel. They can't understand the beauty of the cross. They can't understand the, the beauty of the church and what God has given us here. So they insult and they mock and they reject. But I'm reminded, I'm brought back to this passage, and Paul says he was gentle among them as a nurse that cherisheth her children. He was gentle to be, to be patient and to be kind. And that, that has encouraged my heart to understand that as people are young in the faith and sometimes say things that aren't correct, we're gentle and we nourish them and, and, and love them as a nurse cherisheth her children. And Paul is saying that it's a labor of love, that love is the root. A mother loves her children no matter what. No matter what our children do, we still continue to love them because love is the root that produces the labor. And then number three, back to verse three of chapter one, it says, um, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this part I really like because, again, it is the hope that produces patience. This is talking about the doctrine. This is talking about something rooted and grounded in cement. This is something solid. It's talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter how difficult things are now, Jesus Christ reigns supreme. That Jesus is still on the throne. No matter how difficult things are for us, no matter how challenging things are for us, we look at our society and we think things are a big, giant mess, such as in this circumstances when this, when this book is written. The church is in a mess here. There's moms coming at the church. There's, there's Paul not being able to return to the church he loved. They're trying to struggle, and it says they're they're in suffering, and they're trying to get this, this church going. They're in dire situations and difficult situations. But in spite of all of that, the bedrock of their faith is that Jesus is still on the throne and that Jesus is still reigning tonight as King of kings and as Lord of lords. So that, that hope we have produces in us patience. So hope is the root and patience is the fruit. I'm able to be patient with what's going on and not lose my mind because I know that my hope is in my King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that God is still in control. That is the, the bedrock of our foundation of our hope, that Jesus hasn't given up his authority, that Jesus is still in charge, that God is all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and that God knows exactly what I'm going through. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows the struggles that we face. He knows the battles that come into your life. He knows the heartbreak and the discouragement. He knows the anxiety that we carry and the burdens we carry. He knows all of that. And what, able, what, what helped me be patient, not to become overly frustrated, is that going back to the root is my hope, that we have hope tonight in Jesus Christ. We have hope for our church that we're going to continue to reach our community because there's power in the gospel. We have hope tonight that we're still going to see transformed lives because it's not dependent on us. It's dependent on the power of God. Look in verse number five, if we will, in chapter one, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Here we see this, this key here. Paul is saying that, the word of God came 
in power, in the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to remind us tonight that there's still power in that word, in the, in the word of God. It's powerful and it's sharp and it, and it cuts into the soul of every human being. And the gospel is powerful. It just needs to be proclaimed and shared and preached. That's our job is to share it and proclaim it and preach it. And God does all the rest. Notice in verse 6, it says this, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of what? The Holy Ghost. So now we see that the word of God went out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and now it's being received in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is telling me that God's working both ends of this thing. Like He's, he's working, preparing people to receive the gospel, and he's with me and helping me to preach the gospel. That as I'm living my Christian life and as I'm centered to follow him, he puts me in the place where he's prepared a person for to hear the gospel. I'm here tonight because in 1984, at a bus stop in Baumholder, Germany, a lady took two minutes to invite my mom to church. Two minutes that would change the course of a family forever. Amen. Two minutes at a bus stop to say, hey, I'd like to invite you to my church. We, we meet over here and, and we're just a family. Whatever. I don't even know what she said, but she said that Jesus has changed my life. and He can change yours too. And that's all she said. My dad was in Grafenwehr, Germany. Doing, they're doing a winter exercise and he was a tank mechanic and he's on a cold cement floor working on a tank. And his, and his, his, um, the guy, the soldier w with him was a Christian, a born again Christian was sharing the gospel. My, my dad told me, he says, look, if you'll just shut up, I'll go to church with you on Sunday. <laughs> and so my dad gets back and he says to my mom, he goes, well, you're not going to believe this, but I promised this guy I go to church. And my mom was like, oh, really? What, what church is it? She's like, well, it's the, the Grace Baptist Church. It's right outside the front gate. She said, like, well, that's weird because someone invited me to the same church. And so that was the same day that they went to church and heard the gospel for the very first time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my mom and dad were both born again. Now, my, my dad is still pastoring, still serving God. My brother is a deacon with his family in, his, in the same church serving God. My family and I are missionaries in Spain. And my sister and her husband are missionaries in Spain as well. In the time that my dad pastored, the my dad would go on to pastor the same church where he got saved, the military church. And his he pastored that church for 12 years. In the time he was there, 15 people surrendered to be missionaries and pastors that are serving across the world now. That we know of. There could be more. And it all started with two minutes at a bus stop. Because God prepared the heart of my mom. See, my parents grew up in Florida having seen churches, hadn't gone, they, they even they had gone to youth activities, youth rallies, but never like heard the gospel to like understand what they were listening to. They'd heard it preach, but it didn't, it didn't get here. So my dad, my, my mom and dad are taken all the way to Germany in the 80s in a cold, remote village, separated from their family. This is before cell phones. This is before it was easier to communicate. Tucked away in a small German village, 15 minutes away from the army post so that God would put my mom to, to, to the Holy Spirit was working on her heart, preparing her. And then the Holy Spirit worked on this lady's heart, this Christian from the church to say to her, just tapped her on the shoulder at the bus. I was like, Hey, invite her to church. Just invite her to church. And here we are. Here we are years later, the story that was written. You know, they say, if you give God the pen, He'll write a beautiful story. It's amazing what God can do. And this, this passage encourages me that it's all about Him. The Holy Spirit was working on both ends. The Holy Spirit was working on the lady who shared the gospel, and the Holy Spirit worked on my mom's heart to receive the gospel. So I don't have to be a super slick, super smooth presenter of the gospel, but it's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's realizing it's His power that will open someone's eyes. It's only God who can open a heart. It's only God who can melt that cold heart that rejects the gospel. It's only God who can do a work, and he does. 
it's all about him. And I'm encouraged tonight that it's our faith that produces works. Like Paul is proud saying, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Wow. It's amazing what God can do with a surrendered life. This wasn't the time for Paul to be starting a church. He could have just said, let's just close it down. Let's try somewhere else. Let's give up. Let's quit. Let's do something else. But no, they kept going forward. And they said, God started this church. He'll keep it going. He'll flourish. This church will flourish because it's all done through the power of God. Not through our strength, not through our talents or abilities, but it's God who can take any one of us and do miracles. My question for us is, who will, who will be the person in your life God puts? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe this week. Someone, maybe not at a bus stop, but maybe someone that God has prepared to put in your path whose life you could change forever with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together. We thank you for the church in Thessalonica. This example Paul left us, we see that the gospel still changes hearts and lives. It's the answer to every problem in society. And yet, there's such a rejection to your word, Lord. There's a rejection to this idea that you reign supreme as king of kings. And we're left here on this earth to, to fight this battle. But Father, we know you're with us. And that you empower us as believers to be bold, to stand for truth, and to share, your, to share the gospel. And we also know, Heavenly Father, that you prepare people for us. You go before us to prepare hearts. Lord, you just need us to be sensitive, to follow you, and to be sensitive to respond. When you tell us to share and to be open and ready to give the gospel to whoever we come in contact with. I pray your blessings upon this wonderful church. I pray for as we go in our daily lives that we'll be conscious of the opportunities we have to share about you, Father, to tell others how you've changed our lives, of what you mean to us, and how beautiful it really is to be a born-again Christian, to know you personally and have a personal relationship with you. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what we have in you. This is a beautiful life we have, full of joy that comes from you, full of love that's a pure love that comes from you. And tonight we have something that no one else in the world has, and that's true hope. It's not a false hope, but it's a true hope that's in you, Heavenly Father. And in that we walk tonight. In that we're strong. And we ask you to bless our lives, encourage us,